for another one and plenty of little kids. Well, we've been in this series entitled Wired for Wisdom. It's about applying wisdom in the context of this world in which we live. In a world that's fast-paced, where technology is rampant around us, but we said that there are a lot of things in the modern world that can distract us from what's important in life. And really, the nature of human life, the principles of life, have not changed in thousands of years. There are a lot of new inventions, new things that come along, but how to live life, the fundamentals of human life, they are unchanged. And in fact, that's the reason that we are studying something that is a few thousand years old. Ecclesiastes 3 is where we were the last couple of weeks, and we're going to continue today. And here's a teaching that Solomon wrote a few thousand years ago, and yet it is as pertinent today as at any time in history. And the, you recall that we talked about verse 1 there in chapter 3, where it says, There is a time and a season for every activity under heaven. That is, that each of us needs wisdom to understand the season of life that we are in and the time that God has appointed for certain things. Not everything that God has created, which in and of itself is good, not all of those things are good in the wrong season. That we must have wisdom and understanding in what it is that God would call us to do in any given setting. And so we said that wisdom knows the right time, the right season. I pointed out that, that God himself always knows the right time. And you see, for many of us, that's very important because we may not understand the season or time of our life. And God may be saying, wait, when we want to run ahead. And see, he always knows the right time because as you wait upon him, as you wait upon him to work, he will reveal that which is perfect according to his will, his goodness. And so we continued last week, we were talking about a couple other verses in the very next part there where it says there's a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to tear down, and a time to build. There are times when God calls us to invest in this season of life, like invest in your children, invest in your spouse, maybe invest in your career, or your education, whatever it is. It's a time to build, it's a time to grow. And yet there are seasons that change quickly. Now, I, I recall as a young person perceiving things in the future that you sort of, you work towards something, you got there, and it's almost as if you stayed in this lush valley from that point forward. But anybody who's lived, say, to midlife or further knows that the seasons of life come and go rather quickly. Even, even 10 years, which as a very young man, that seems like a long time, but, but 10 years sometimes seems like a very brief moment. Just a, a, a single period of time that passed far more quickly than you could have anticipated. And so it is important that we know what season we are in. Is it a time to build or is it a time to uproot and go in another direction? Sometimes God calls us to withdraw from things that have in and of themselves been good because he's got a new direction, a new season for us. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I've been in a season that I would call a mountaintop experience, something good, I have tended to want it to do what? Stay there. Hold on to it. Like, remember the transfiguration? Jesus is, is there. He's transfigured in a unique way. And Peter, James, and John are with him. And they want to do what? They want to build facilities and stay there. Because it's such a wonderful experience. And there are lots of things that I've wanted to hold on to. But I yet knew that the season had come to an end. It was time to let go. Time to uproot and head in another direction. And we talked too last week about this one that says there's a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. And the, the corollary scripture in Romans that says rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who who's also mourn. And we said that in our culture there are a lot of people who don't understand the right season of when to laugh and when to mourn. Some people laugh at others when they're hurt and wounded, which is the wrong time to laugh. And sometimes we grieve about things that really, they're not all that significant. Things of the world, that physical things that we thought were important, but when in reality, relationships and people are far more important. I mean, there are those who grieve over lost money and things of that nature, but don't care much about people. And you see, there's, there's the right time to mourn the right things. 
Now, I want to continue in Ecclesiastes 3 because, you know, there's an abundance of wisdom in a few small statements right there in those verses. And so this week, I want to start by what's in verse 5. It says, there is a time to embrace and a time to refrain. In other words, every person needs the wisdom to know that there is a time when I say yes to opportunities, when I move forward in that direction, and a time to say no, to step back, to refrain. And all of us, in the busyness of the world in which we live, we're going to have many things that come our way, some of which are good things, but they are not God's thing for that time. For example, I've been asked to do a variety of things over recent years that in and of themselves they were good things. But I had to say no most of the time because it took too much time or would have been too much of an investment when I knew that there were other places where I needed to have my focus. And so I, needed, I knew that there was a time to refrain from something even though it was a good thing. And of course there's a lot of wisdom in knowing when to refrain from those things that can be potentially damaging to your life unwise choices, things that tempt you in ways that are not of the Lord. And you see, there is great wisdom in knowing when to step back, when to say no. For some of us here, the wisest thing we need to learn to do is say no. Like, for me, it's like no to chocolate chip cookies. Or no to the 11th chocolate chip cookie, you know what I mean? But with all of us, we need additional self-control. In fact, I put this scripture in Galatians that we've talked about a lot, <clears throat> that the fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, and patience, and so on, and self-control. And you see, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. I always try to emphasize that because it, it boggles my mind that there are lots of churches that they're afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. I don't say you can live the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit dwells within you. He wants to manifest the life of Christ through you. And the fruit of the Spirit naturally flow from His work in a yielded person. As you yield to the Spirit, His fruit come through you. So you're going to be more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, and more self-controlled. Now, let us suppose that you were praying and said, Lord, please give me more self-control. Can you imagine that He would say, Nah, you don't need it. You got enough. I dare say that there is not a single person who couldn't use more self-control with areas of their life. I mean, could be with their eating or their exercise or their sleep or their words or whatever it is. All of us need greater self-control. And you see, as I ask for that, as I ask the Lord to give me self-control, He will fulfill and answer that prayer. There have been times when I've been in difficult situations and, and uh, somewhat challenging in terms of what others were saying to me or, or what maybe I felt like responding to them. And I've really, in that moment, just like, Lord, keep my tongue clear. Let me not say things that I would then later wish I had not said. And so, in fact, what we want to talk about mostly today is this scripture in Ecclesiastes 3 7 that says, There is a time to be silent and a time to speak. And one of the marks of a very wise and godly person is that they understand these two things very well. In fact, with regard to a time to speak, there is a time to say godly words. There is a time to encourage others. There is a time sometimes to confront someone. Or a time to take a little risk and step out of your comfort zone and go and speak to somebody you don't know. You know, on some occasions, I've been in some context, it's happened here many times, but, but in some context outside of here where... I've just noticed a person. I didn't know the person. But I noticed them. They were sort of alone. I could tell by reading their face 
that there was pain in their heart or they were grieving or something was going on. And you know, it's easy just to ignore those things, but sometimes the Lord is saying, you need to go there. Just chat with them, encourage them. Sometimes I've done so and the Lord has opened the door very quickly for them to share the struggle they were in and just to pray with them. And see, there is a time to speak, a time to step forward. In fact, after the first service, I, d I didn't emphasize that part as much. I talked more about the time to be silent or when to say the right words. And a lady came up to me after the first service and she said, you know, there is a time to speak certain important words. And she said that she and her brother were talking and that they said, I don't ever recall our mother saying that she loves us, either one individually. So they, they grew up, now this is a lady who's later in life, she said, they grew up and neither one of them could ever recall their own mother saying, I love you. Some of you probably had that experience. I mean, I know a gentleman who never heard his father say that because his father deserted him when he was a very little boy. In, in fact, by deserting, he was saying what? I don't love you. I love myself more. And so there is a time to speak, a time to say words that are a blessing. But unfortunately, in our culture, a lot of people speak words that are unwise. And it doesn't take very long to hear it. Just be in any public setting and just allow your ears to listen to what you hear around you and you will hear unwise and unwholesome words. And so in 1 Corinthians, now this is the love chapter, chapter 13, but in there it says this, that when I was a child, I talked like a child, that I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish ways. Now the reality is, an immature, childish person thinks and speaks in ways that are not the most godly. In fact, a, an immature person, I'll give you a little list here, they speak words that are along this line. First of all, they are self-centered words. See, the reality is of a little child, we are born perfectly self-centered. That's the reality of this depraved nature that we have. And we think the world revolves around us. We can't really think abstractly. We think primarily about ourselves. And a mark of maturity is learning to think more about others and less about ourselves. But you see, a, ch a childish person's words, they are self-centered. They're false. That is, they, they lie sometimes. They're not truthful. They are disrespectful to those who are in authority whether it's to a parent or somebody else that's in authority. Their words lack control. That is, they just tend to spew out a lot of things. Sometimes, not, not just childish words, but the words of one who has matured that is lacking self-control, sometimes their words are vulgar. Now, sarcastic words, sometimes they're okay, but really a lot of sarcastic words are inappropriate because they tend to do what? They tend to be spoken at the expense of somebody else and harm that person, making fun of that person. I find it rather interesting about Tim Tebow. I've mentioned him on a couple of occasions. You know, he's a Christian man. He's very outspoken, which makes him a target for those who are very opposed to godliness. And even in recent days, I've, I've noticed there'd be a little article or something that's basically a very sarcastic article about him because he's currently out of the NFL. Well, I'm, God's not surprised by where he is and maybe going back to that sport's never where he's supposed to be, but God has a plan and purpose for him that I think he would stay focused on. But there are a lot of those who like to speak sarcastic words about him as a person. And then there are those who like to gossip. You know, the scripture warns very seriously and intently about gossip. And there are many people who don't realize how extensive is the gossip that comes from their mouth. I mean, gossip is repeating hearsay about other persons. And it also involves, even if it's hearsay is 
something that I don't know factually, that I, I don't know firsthand. But then even if I do know something factually, it is not wise for me to repeat that which is true about somebody else unless it's an uplifting and wholesome thing. And there are a lot of people who have an issue with gossip. In fact, I've encountered people where I've, I've not said this to them, but I really wanted to sort of just give them a little tap on the face and say, look, if you weren't a gossip, you wouldn't have this problem. But Because they had created a little mess by the words they had said, and then they wanted me to somehow help them with it. And there are some people whose words are vitriolic. Now, I put that word up there knowing that probably most people don't know what the word means. But it's time to learn a little something. Vitriolic words are words that are intended to harm. They are premeditated. In other words, they are planned words that have the intention of harming. It's like a person who gets really angry about something and then stews about it and thinks for a long period of time about all the things they want to say to somebody else to get back at them, and then they lack the self-control to hold back, and instead they just utter all of those words that they've been thinking, and their only goal is to hurt somebody else to exact revenge, so to speak, through harmful words. And see now, if we were to stop for a moment and take a little evaluation, is there anybody in the room here who always speaks words that have been thought out well, that are wholesome, encouraging, that, that you never make any mistakes with your words, that in fact you are an expert when it comes to linguistics? Is there anybody here who would meet all those criteria? The perfect person I was looking for. Now, there's some people I know that I think are good. I mean, rarely would I hear something come from their mouth that would not really honor God. But even some of the best that I've known on an occasion, under maybe stress or tension or something eh, something they've said now the reality is that every person in this room me included that we could grow in terms of words that are good in fact just a couple of weeks ago i said something i really said it in in jest in humor but as i said it like it sort of, it, you know, this thought came into my mind and it exited my mouth. And when it got about right there, I tried to grab it and bring it back. But of course, it was too late. And the problem was what I had said in humor may have not really, people there may not have thought much about it. But, but I immediately felt uncomfortable about it. I immediately felt conviction about it. And I think it was the Holy Spirit wasn't something sinful per se that I had said, but, but as I thought through, what was the source of that reasoning for that little bit of humor? And it took me a little while to think about it, but a few hours later I realized that the source of that humor was a way that I looked at life before I became a Christian. And it was unwholesome and therefore unwise to speak. And then I also had to confess that shortly ago, a few weeks ago, I was having a conversation and um, had zero intent to say anything that was in any way harmful or anything like that. But, but you've probably had this experience where you, where you started speaking and your goal was to say this, but as you were speaking, your words just didn't come out the way you intended and the person surely heard something that was different from what you intended. You know, it's, you might be intending to say something encouraging to someone, but the way you say it just doesn't quite measure up to what your goal was. And so all of us have the reality that we could grow in our words. Now, mature words are like this. They're wise. They're truthful. They're honest. They're kind. You know, you can confront someone, be tough with them in a harsh situation and still have kind words. 
In other words, you could be a boss, you got an employee who's not meeting their responsibilities, and you could be firm with them, but you can still be kind. Wise words are comforting to others, they're encouraging to others. Really mature words are healing to other people. You know, sometimes the most healing thing you can say to somebody else is, I'm sorry, or would you forgive me? Or sometimes it's just encouraging somebody with your words to help them deal with a difficult situation. Just to help them face the reality of what's going on in their life and, and to let them know that you're there with them, that you agree. In fact, I keep thinking of this. I'm going to tell you this story. I've told this story before, but it's worth telling again. I had a student many years ago, and, and I'm going to make it real brief. Um, she had come to me to talk to me about some problems in her academic record that she wanted to get cleaned up. And um, so as we talked about why she had this problem, she had dropped out one semester in the midst of the semester. Some of you may remember this story. And she, I asked her, obviously, well, why... Did you drop out? And she said, well, I was raped that semester. And she became pregnant by the rape. And so she had dropped out of school. This was several years later that she had returned to school and she was trying to get her degree and um, she had a small child. And at the time that she was raped, she was not a Christian. She... She said everybody around her encouraged her to abort that child. She said her own mother told her that, look, every time you look into the face of that child, you're going to think of this person who raped you, and you just need to put this behind you. And despite the fact that she was not a Christian, she said there was something in her heart that said she could not abort that child. And so this girl, she is there explaining to me that she had chosen to give birth to that child. And not only that, she had chosen to keep the child. And the little girl, I think, was about three years old or something at that time. And I didn't, I didn't give it much thought. I just said this. I said, do you realize what a godly decision that was to have that child? How you honored God by choosing, in spite of all of the pain that you dealt with, to have a child and to bring that child into this world. That, that girl burst into tears. She said, nobody has ever said to me that was a good decision. Everybody had said to her it was a bad decision. And yet she said, I love my little girl. I'm glad I had her. But she said nobody had ever said to her that was a good choice. And yet it was a great choice. And you see, I didn't, I didn't give it much thought. I just spoke something that was a healing word to her by saying that was a good decision. And the, I have to tell you the rest of that story. I had her as a student then for a year or two, and I don't remember exactly when it was, but somewhere in there... She, she told me that her mother was actually the person keeping her daughter while she was coming to school. And this was going on for some significant period of time. And she came to me one day. She was so excited. She was just bubbling with, with uh, smiles on her face. And she said, you won't believe what my mom said. She said, my mother, the one who had d encouraged her not to have that child, my mother, who's now keeping the child regularly because she'd gone back to school, her mother had said, I'm so thankful that you had this little girl. That she had realized and changed. And you see, the power of those words to bring healing and the, the healing words that came from her mother. And, and, and to continue that story, this, this young lady got married and, and her uh, husband legally adopted, however process is, is if I understood, remember it correctly, this child that she'd had earlier. But you see now, sometimes words, they can wound. Now, I'd dare say every person in this room, could you not make a list of the words that people spoke to you that wounded your soul? 
I bet some of you can remember words that were spoken to you 30 years ago or 40 years ago or maybe longer, wounds that wounded your soul. They were not healing words, but they were wounds that were like a dagger or worse, like a machete that cut right into your heart. Like I've counseled with people who've, who've said, like my dad said to me, I was stupid. And you've never forgotten that. You, you, you won't forget it, but you can forgive it and it can be free from it. In fact, every word like that, it is a healthy thing to, to think it through, write it down, and to say, Lord Jesus, I am willing to forgive. Give me the ability to forgive the person who spoke these words to me. That you could release them and be free from any harmful words. And I'll tell you, some of the things that grieve me significantly are things that I think about that I did years ago, words that I uttered that I wish I had never said. I remember, I remember one time saying something. Again, I was saying it in jest, which is sometimes stupid, but I said it in jest, and then this young lady who, who really was the consequence of my humor, she just began to cry. Never forgotten that. I dare she say she's never forgotten it either. I hope she's forgiven me. And I thank the Lord that he would forgive me. But do you understand how important it is, the words that we say? Now, in James it says this. That the tongue is a very powerful thing. It says... That you take animals, for example, you can put a bit in their mouth and you can turn them. Or you can take a ship and you can guide it by a very small thing. A little rudder can determine the whole direction of where it will go. And James says, likewise, that the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. In other words, it can determine the direction of your life. It says, consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. That the tongue, likewise, is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. Now, there's some people whose, whose words are like that of a flamethrower. Wherever they speak, they just tend to wound and harm and hurt those who are around them. And then there are some people whose words are just like medicine to the soul. I was thinking about this just recently. I was thinking about my grandmothers, both of whom are deceased. And, but I knew both of them for a, a good number of years. And uh, they both lived well into their 80s and so forth. And I was thinking, in all of the years that I knew them, in all of the experiences I had with them, I cannot remember a single word that either one of them uttered that was ungodly. Not one. They both knew the Lord. They were both, both loving people both kind, they were very different in personality and very different in outlook on life. But I cannot re remember a single negative word from either one of them. And yet both of them had been through life, difficult things in life. One of them, her husband died when she was 40 years old or around 40, and she never remarried. Lived to be 80-something. She could have been bitter and angry with God. Instead, she was encouraging and loving and supportive. The other one had two of her three children die. One died at a, at a very, very young age, and another died when she was in her 20s. Only My dad, only one of her three children lived throughout her lifetime. She could have been bitter and angry and harmed and hurt, but she was loving and kind and spoke words that were godly which is the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in her soul. Now, James even says this. He says, look, no man can tame the tongue, which is really a difficult scripture because he's saying, look, no person can fully tame the tongue. Hopefully we will gain good self-control and, and be godly people, but I dare say the best of us from time to time still, it's like, oh, that wicked tongue. He even says, look, with the tongue we praise the Lord and at the same time we curse men. You could have told your spouse off on the way to church today and walked in and praised the Lord with the same tongue. 
Some of you may have done that at some point in time. It's the reality of life. You know, the, one of the realities of life is sometimes the most difficult struggles families have is on the way to church or trying to get to church. Because there are spirits of evil that want to mess you up and they want to turn you around. They don't want you to be encouraged. They don't want you to grow. They want you to be in struggle. But now, the issue really is this. What is the source of the words that you speak? James says that out of the same mouth come praising and cursing. And he said this shouldn't be, but, but can both fresh water and salt water come from the same spring? In other words, he's saying, can you speak godly loving words of life? Or can you speak unwholesome words at the same time if the source is really genuine? Now, I've known people, some of you probably have known people who their words in some context were very good and their words in another context weren't. For example, somebody who at their work, they would be very well respected, always speak good things. But in their home life, they could be very harsh and bitter and mean and critical with their words. And see, in that case, there's a problem with the source. In their case, they're, they're not really surrendered to the Lord, not really surrendered to his spirit. They're speaking out of the flesh a lot of the time. And see, one of the most significant scriptures in all of the Bible to me and helping me understand humanity is this. I've said it several times and I'll repeat it many more. But it says that a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart and the evil brings evil out of the things that are stored up in his heart. But out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you know, when a person gets under pressure, under stress, or they're emotionally charged, and they're speaking, you're likely to see what's really in their heart. Things are going to come out that are stored up there. And you see, the reality is that all of us have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God. And all of us have stored up some things in our heart that aren't good. And, and part of this maturing as Christ and in Christ and becoming like him as we go through this life is learning to sift those things and get rid of the things that are in our hearts that are not of him. That my words might always be those that would lift up others. Encourage others. Now, it also says this in Ecclesiastes in a different chapter. It says, the words from a wise man's mouth are gracious, but that a fool is consumed by his own lips. Which is an interesting thing. That his, that his own words bring destruction upon him. It even says that the words of a fool multiply. It's like if you tell one lie, you're inevitably going to have to do what? Tell more lies to cover up the first lie. Your words are going to multiply in a negative, destructive way. It's like these athletes on the performance-enhancing drugs and how many of them had lied repetitively for years and finally are now saying, well, yes, I did that. Well, there is a cost. And you see, the wise person knows when to speak. James says that everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, let me talk about two aspects of that. Sometimes in life, I have encountered, and I'm sure you have too, situations that had become very difficult with another person. Where maybe there were, you were angry or they were angry or there's some really difficult circumstance or something that needed to be confronted, whatever the difficult situation. And in some of those, I've really wanted to just run away and not deal with it. But I knew that the Lord was calling me to deal with it. And I knew also, though, that if I did not have good self-control and, con and control of my words, that the situation could escalate into a bigger problem. In fact, um, a few years ago, um, 
Gary Smalley was here to teach a, a seminar on marriage. And one of the things they talked about in that seminar was the problem of couples having a disagreement that then escalated. It started with some little issue and then she said something and he said something and they kept upping the ante, so to speak, in terms of their anger and the words that they were saying. And pretty soon they would escalate into a full-blown explosion. And you see, that's not a healthy thing. Rarely is that going to accomplish something good. Now, I said rarely because I do think there are a few occasions where an explosion can be healthy. Where people have kept stuff bottled up for years and they just need to get it out on the table. But the vast majority of the time, an explosion is going to be damaging. And so, like I say, I've been in those situations and I have really prayed going in and while there that the Lord would give me control over my words, that I would not speak anything that would be out of his will. And I've had the experience, and probably some of you have had this experience, where I had, during such a time that was very difficult, very challenged, very emotional, that I was able to have peace that passed all understanding, and it was as if the Spirit of the Lord literally had control of my tongue. That, that even though normally my emotions might have been wound up and I might have wanted to say something, that instead I had peace and control that had to be supernatural, had to be from the Spirit. And you see, anytime you are in those kind of situations, the Spirit of the Lord in you, He can give you perfect wisdom about when to speak and when to just listen. Now, this part about listening... I think that there in the program where I put the questions at the bottom, the last question I put there is something about, are you a good listener? Ask the person next to you what they think. Now, do you know people who are good listeners? And would people categorize you as a good listener? Now, Honestly, for a number of years now, I've made it a personal goal to be a better listener. To listen to people as they're speaking, to try to really understand what they're saying, and to keep my words in check. And a good barometer, a good measuring stick is this. In any conversation, do you speak less than you listen? Or at least, is it about equal? In other words, do you listen about as much of the time as you speak in any conversation? Because if it's really... Now, there might be a few times where it needs to be unbalanced because of the nature of the conversation. If you're, if you're the teacher in a classroom, then obviously you probably do most of the teaching. But, but in most conversations with people... Is it reasonably balanced? Now, you see, those of us who tend to be more verbose, who are, are, who are extroverts by nature, we need to learn to listen more. And those of us who tend to be introverted usually need to learn to speak more. Both of us have areas to grow. But is there reasonable balance in your conversations? This past um, summer... In July, I believe it was, uh, we were visiting my wife's family in Ohio, and um, I ended up spending a la large part of one day with one of her cousins uh, and a few of their family members. And now this is somebody that I've known for many years, that I've had a variety of conversations with over those years. But you know how it is when you go to visit family. You usually only get to spend a few minutes with the cousins. And, you know, you talk to them briefly and how's it going and how are your kids and yada, yada. And, and you don't really get into much depth of conversation. And so this is a gentleman that I've known a long time. I've respected him. He's a Christian man. I always thought highly of him. And uh, yet I've never spent hours really talking with him. And it so happened that this summer in visiting there that we ended up spending the better part of a day together and I got to spend a very long time just talking with him. In fact, at one part, we, we, we drove 
uh, over an hour to get to where we were going that day on an outing. And at one part of that conversation, I believe everybody else in the car fell asleep. I was driving and he was awake and everybody else was asleep, right? Because we had to get up really early in the morning and go and so forth. And so he and I talked for hours. And when I came back that day, I said to my wife, I said, you know what? He is an excellent conversationalist. I mean, just excellent. And I, I explained to her why. First of all, he's a, he is a godly person. He's got wisdom and maturity. He's, he's, he's a thinker. Like he, he doesn't just spew out words. His words are things that he's thought through. And he's well-versed on significant topics. Like he understands principles of life from a godly perspective. So he's, he's done a lot of reading, a lot of study. He's well-versed. He's, when he speaks, there's some wisdom in what he has to say. But not only that, not only can he speak about a lot of topics, but, but he's a listener. What I realized, I so enjoyed talking to him that day because he, he is a, a deep thinker. And there's a lot going on. But, but he would say something and then he would stop. And he would just listen. He would, he would respect me enough to allow me to share deeply on that topic. And I would dare say at the end of the day, it was just about 50-50 in terms of listening and talking. And I said, he is an excellent conversationalist. And that should be the goal for any of us. Sometimes, I mean, literally, I'll be in a conversation and I'll catch myself thinking, I need to be quiet. I am speaking too much. And I will intentionally come to an end of a statement and just stop and wait. And think, I'm just going to listen. I'm going to wait until they get ready to share what they want to share. And sometimes, you know, it depends on the person. Sometimes there might be an awkward few seconds where there's just nothing being said. And yet, I'll just wait. And see, part of being a wise person with your words is knowing when not to speak. And just... See, when, when you listen to somebody else, you're saying to them, I care. It's a way of saying, I love you. You know, parents have this problem, do they not? You know, their kids, especially when they're little, there's a lot of chaos going on, and you're always trying to keep them in order, and you're always talking to them. And is it not easy to become the one who is always speaking and not listening? And part of listening is not just the words that people speak, but it is also the tone that they use and their body language. Because, you know, I try to avoid this, but I inevitably do it. But, you know, like if I'm passing somebody, I try to avoid saying, how are you doing? Because it's a cliche in our culture and I just don't like it. I'd rather just speak something that is more clear and genuine. But from time to time, I've said, hi, how are you? And people said, oh, fine. And what do you do? Great. See you. Bye. You know. No real conversation. But on occasion, I've said, how are you? And I've had somebody say, fine. Now, years ago when they said that, I would have what? More than likely just said, well, great. Have a nice day. But many times now, when I hear somebody respond with, fine, I'll go, that didn't sound so good. What's going on? I've even said that with people I didn't know very well. And I would say eight or nine out of ten times, they've opened right up just about, this is what I'm dealing with, and this is where I am in life, and this is where my struggle is today. And see, being a good listener is listening not to what they say in just a literal sense, but what they're saying by their body language, their tone, other things. And this is why this is very important in a technological society. Because it is very hard to really listen and hear what another person is saying through email or text messages. And you must have wisdom about what is the appropriate means of communication for the topic that I'm dealing with. In other words, email is a wonderful thing if you're setting up a meeting. Everybody needs to know the exact time, the exact location. You need to send out directions, and you're, you send that out to all the people who need to be there. That's a wonderful thing. Text messaging can be a great thing to just say, hey, I arrived, or I'll be there at 4, or something. But if you and your spouse just had a major argument, 
and you go to work the next day and you're still stewing and you're trying to do your work, but you think I'll type up an email and send it to her and let her know what I feel about this and just boom, boom, boom. And you're just firing off these emails that are vitriolic. That may not be the wisest form of communication. It could be that for some of you to be able to write out your words and communicate if you've thought them through might be a healthy thing. But you know, I've written quite a number of emails and then I pray about, before I send things, if, they're, if they have any significance to them, I've written quite a number of emails that I really felt like the Lord said, hit the delete button. I'm serious. Sometimes I've even realized as I was writing it that I was going to delete it, but it was still healthy to write it, to get it out of my system, to think about it, and say, Lord, I forgive them and move on, but don't hit the send button. But I'm sure some of you have done this. You've hit the send button and you were glad you hit the send button, right? You're like, I can't wait till they read that. You even put with a read receipt on it so you'd know when you made a man. But you never got the read receipt. You wondered for days whether or not you really got them or not. You know what I'm saying? See, in our culture, it does take wisdom to determine the appropriate means to communicate with somebody else. Now, sometimes people hide behind email or something like that because they don't want to deal with the riskiness and the emotional difficulty of a face-to-face -face conversation. But that is exactly what is needed. I mean, I've even had people... Send things to me that I responded by when they were upset about something. I responded by, let's talk about that. I didn't respond to their email. I didn't answer their email. I said, let's talk about that at such and such time. And see, it takes wisdom to see. We're, we're speaking words now in ways that people never could speak them before. I mean, you could speak them through written word and send them by a letter, which would have taken a long time, as we talked about before, but you couldn't speak it through this quick text message or email or even, or even phone calls. And see, sometimes phone calls are a healthy way to deal with something, and sometimes they're not because you can't see the body language of the person. And sometimes the written word is in an email or something is the wrong way to approach dealing with a very emotional issue. Because what you intend to write and what they actually read in their minds may be something different. In fact, just this week, I, I did send a factual email. See, email's great for facts. I sent a factual email to a gentleman in response to something that he had said. Now, he lives in another, another state. And after I sent it, a day or two later, I thought, I bet he thinks I'm mad. I'm not mad. But given the little two or three short interchanges of emails, I was thinking, I bet he thinks I'm mad. And I'm not, and I'm, I'm going to have to address that this week. But you see, I, I dare say there's been a little sense of miscommunication right there. But now, just in leaving this teaching, I would say that all of us could pray repetitively, Lord, Make me one who is a better listener, who has better control of the words that I say, that let the words of my mouth always be something that are edifying to others and glorifying to God. Let's pray. Lord, I do ask that your spirit would be upon each of us, maybe to convict some of us for words that we've said that were not of you and that we need to go and ask for forgiveness or to rectify some situation. And that we each would have greater self-control, that we would think through wisely the words that we utter before they exit our mouths, that we would speak truth and love and blessing in the lives of others. And I pray especially right now, Lord, for every person here who has a wound in their soul that came from words. Maybe a parent who told them they would never amount to anything or someone that they love to told them they don't ever want to talk to them again and said 
said so in words that were very, very harmful and hurting. I pray that your healing power, whatever it is, would be upon each person here for the words that have penetrated their souls and wounded their hearts. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.